Okay, very good. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this. So far, this has been uh, very stimulating and interesting, and uh, I hope to interest you in what I have to say. So I'm George Contreras. I teach at American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am a lawyer, as was mentioned earlier, but I, also I, I can't help you with the traffic tickets that, uh, that you got coming down from Rome. Um, my early training in education was in electrical engineering, uh, so I do have some semi-scientific background, and uh, I've spent a lot of time working both as a lawyer and as sort of a policy analyst um, in the genomics area, starting during the Human Genome Project and through today uh, with these projects continue. Um, so I'm going to be talking, when I first spoke to Giovanni about this conference, I, I thought I would give a historical perspective on how these data sharing policies evolved in the Genome Project and beyond because it's very interesting and it's somewhat different from the models we've been talking about. But then over the summer, some very interesting developments happened in the data sharing world in the United States. Um, and I thought that I would spend, you know, half of the time then talking about those because I think they're of an even more immediate interest to the group. So, sorry. Okay. So to talk about, to talk about um, data sharing in the United States, it's important to understand where scientific research is funded because much of our policy comes from the government and the biggest funder of private research is the government. So you can see here's all R&D expenditure in the United States, uh, 2009, a little bit old, but it takes a while for these statistics to be compiled. About $250 billion worth of research in industry, um, but most of that is the great development. Basic research and applied research is still primarily funded by the federal government, and that's about $125 billion worth of research, which is which is still quite big. This other at the far end is generally private charities um, and private foundations. Okay. That's where it's funded. Um, who are the agencies that fund this research? Well, you won't be surprised. The Department of Defense is the big blue thing on the right. We're not getting a lot of data sharing out of that. <laughs> Don't worry. Ignore the 50%, 72 billion dollars. So that that creates the, uh, the drones that are probably flying over us right now. <laughs> it's a secret. Um, stuff on the left hand side uh, is open to sharing. NIH is the red. That's our National Institutes of Health. Um, it funds about $31 million of research per year. The Department of Energy is the green light, just above that at about $12 billion. Um, Department of Energy, of course, you know, petroleum and uh, gasoline, but also nuclear power, uh, solar energy, alternative fuel sources, biofuel. There's a lot of energy research, and, and the Department of Energy is getting an expanding budget in the United States, just given uh, concerns about energy independence and so forth. And NASA, of course, is the next one, about $10 billion, and we all know what they do. Um, and, and, you know, the rest, again, uh, is, is fairly self-explanatory. So, so, again, we are talking about $70 plus billion dollars worth of research that is potentially available to uh, be in the data sharing pool. Okay. The other thing to understand in the U.S. is that intellectual property affects all of these discussions. So, uh, back in my school, I teach intellectual property law. That is my field as an academic, as a professional, um, and primarily patent. And back in 1980, uh, these two senators, um, these two senators passed this act uh, named after them, the Bayh-Dole Act, which said that. The federal agencies who were funding this research used to each have their own policy relating to patents. So we have 20 different federal policies relating to patents. And there was some inefficiency in that, to be sure, quite a bit of confusion. Final has consolidated all federal patent policy for government-funded work into one policy. 
and that policy is pro-patent. Uh, it not just allows, but encourages researchers who are funded by the government to get the patent on their work. If they don't, they're penalized, for right? The right to those inventions will go back to the government. So universities especially <coughs> have been very keen to patent their inventions. Now, was mentioned before, data itself cannot be patented, cannot be copyrighted. Um, but, you know, not very far from the line of what is data, you have things that can be patented. Um, and we've seen just this summer in the United States the latest Supreme Court case about patenting genetic data. Um, the Supreme Court just held in the U.S. that you can't patent raw human genetic sequence data, um, but you can patent it if you reconstruct it uh, yourself. Um, so there's again a very gray line. Okay. That's, that's the background. Now, the federal government of the U.S. has historically had a fairly liberal policy towards the release of data. Um, that data release is generally upon publication of whatever the scientific work is, and, you know, <coughs> excuse me, the U.S. National Weather Service the, um, the uh, global positioning system data, these have been publicly available for decades, uh, even before the internet, right? And they're fully open, anybody can access GPS. I mean, it's not, it's not the defense level GPS coordinates that, that are used internally by you know, the military, but it's pretty good GPS. It's a GPS that runs many of the things that are in our cars and iPhones. Produce free government data, as weather data, time zone data. Many of these things are already in place. Now, the Human Genome Project has represented a change in the Watson, you probably all know. Um, 1988, uh, the Human Genome Project was kicked off. Uh, at this point, this was revolutionary. We're going to sequence the entire human genome, 3.2 billion base pairs of DNA. 1992, uh, the first policy around release of that data was established. So there was a feeling that, well, this data should be released to the public. Everybody should have this data um, as part of the common human heritage. The, uh, the Sanger Center at Cambridge uh, and the Wellcome Trust uh, and, and the European uh, EMDL all come up involved in these initial discussions about the genome project. They all participated. So that's 1992. There were three design goals that policymakers had when they were putting these policies in place. One was basic scientific site coordination. We're going to do lots of sequencing centers, all sequencing little pieces of the genome. They all need to be knit together um, so that we would get the complete sequence accurately and quickly. So we had to coordinate sites in Japan and Europe and uh, several in the United States. Doing that, it was important to release that. But that data didn't have to be released to the public, right? There were lots of times where multiple sites coordinate and they released data to each other, but not to the public. Here, there was going to be public data released because there was a strong feeling that that would advance science, science overall. And uh, they were right, right? There have been studies that have been done now showing that there has been a huge payoff from the uh, genetic information that was released from the human genome project. But there was a third policy factor present in these discussions. That was minimizing the patentability of this material. Um, it's very interesting because in the early 1990s, NIH was one of the first groups to start to patent human DNA sequences. Craig Fenter, who uh, you may see a picture of, should soon, uh, was actually a scientist at NIH at one of the institutes and got the idea to patent uh, DNA. First, while he was at NIH, and NIH actually filed and he patented very early, people like Jim Watson hated this idea, thought it was crazy and terrible. And uh, eventually, NIH reversed its position entirely, abandoned all of its own patents that it had filed on uh, human DNA. But patenting was very much on the mind of the scientists who were creating these data release policies at the highest levels of the institute. So in 1996, four years after the 
all of the organizers who trust and from NIH and the various sequence contenders met in Bermuda, uh, nice place, Hamilton, Fairmont Hotel, and uh, got together and decided that just an idea if you were thinking of the next conference. <laughs> um, they got together and said, listen, six months, releasing six months after this disaster was generated is okay, but we need it faster. It would be better if we released sooner. And why not release it within a day, within 24 hours after it is generated? That's possible, right? The internet exists at this point. Um, and so those are the Bermuda principles. They agreed, and all of the major funding agencies went along. There's an official NIH policy that followed this requirement. That within 24 hours, not after a journal article is published, right? But within 24 hours after the data is generated um, and assembled, uh, you know, a broad sequence reads basically coming out of the sequence machines once it's you know, validated. Um, it's, it's going up on the web, and anybody can look at it. Um, so this was revolutionary, right? This is very different than the model, where you wait until a scientist publishes their article, and then make the data available, right, under the old um, NASA and you know, other types of federal guidelines. Quite revolutionary. Um, it made coordination of the sites quite possible, and this was important because they were racing, of course, to see what the genome cost us that second, um, release it for public good, and this immediate data release had a very important effect as far as patents, right, for two reasons. First, it prevents the groups who are doing the sequencing from getting patents, right, as Julie mentioned, uh, yes, in the U.S., you have a year grace period after you publish a work to go ahead and file a patent. Here, you, you can't file a patent application in one day. Um, so, if you produce this data for the government, and the government did pay quite a bit for this data, um, you give up the right to patent essentially because you've released it to the public. The other good thing that it does is the data is out there very fast and it prevents somebody else from getting a patent. Somebody else who's working independently of you generating the same sequence, you can't patent that sequence once it's already out there in the public database. So it supports patenting at two levels, primarily by this guy. Right? So this is Craig Venter. Um, that's his book. That's uh, very popular. <coughs> he, if you know, as I mentioned, uh, was an NIH scientist wasn't happy with how things were going at NIH, went off, formed his own company, um, got a lot of funding from a uh, biotech company, uh, got a bunch of sequencing machines, and announced that he was going to jump into the race, into the sequencing race, and beat the NIH project by four years. Um, which, you know, he was actually quite smart, but he invented new ways of sequencing by chopping up the genome into lots of little pieces and basically having computers figure out how to put it together. It was brilliant work. Um, and it, his entry into the race did make the public project move along a little bit faster. So that was good. Competition is good in that way. The difference with his project and the government project, though, is that he wanted to monetize the data that came out of his project. Right? He wasn't going to release it to the public. He was going to sell access to his database. And he got subscribers, pharmaceutical companies, to subscribe to the Solera database for millions of dollars. Um, because this is important and valuable data that they couldn't generate themselves. Uh, he took a lot of heat for this, right? There was a very big debate. Um, ultimately, the two projects uh, sort of raced and and uh, President Clinton and Tony Blair had to get involved, and, and eventually they declared it a tie, and everybody went to the White House, and they had a ceremony in the Rose Garden where they announced that they, you know, they both sequenced the genome at the same time, and Nature published one group of sequence, and, and Science published the other, I forget which was which. And, and Venter eventually, eventually uh, did put his data into the public domain as well, um, the business model never really took off for his data business, uh, nor for any of the other 
sort of genome data companies that popped up at the same time, but they were there, and the potential was there, and had the public project not existed with the public alternative, you know, it's quite possible that we might be still paying to access genome data, right? So because if there weren't the public alternative, the only alternative would have been to, uh, to subscribe. And there have been a lot fewer scientific discoveries as a result of that. So anyway, the Genome Project was essentially completed in 2001. That's when the, the work kept on going for a few more years, but effectively done in 2001. Uh, Solera, uh, they but there are lots of follow-on projects, right? We, we sequence the genome, but there we realize we still don't know anything about how the human genome works. Uh, um, okay, and one thing, one thing that we are realizing then after 2001 is that the Bermuda principles, which are great for many reasons, they didn't really respect um, the rights and the ability of the scientists who were creating the sequence data to publish on that data, right? We had this big blockbuster publication in Science and Nature in 2001, and everybody was working toward that, and that was a great thing to have on your CV if you were an author on one of those papers. But, but after that, you know, their data was out in the public. Anybody could look at it, and these guys did not have a head start. They couldn't because they had 24-hour head start to do the analysis of the data, and they didn't like that. That was um, something that they started to grumble about quite a bit, and, and so yeah, so we eliminate the head start that they have on the analysis of their data. Now bear in mind, they are being paid by the taxpayers to create this data, so their salaries and their labs and all the fancy equipment are being paid for, but they aren't getting Okay, so, in 2003, this big summit occurs, again, all the leaders come, they meet at another beach location in Fort Lauderdale this time, and they talk about this problem, and, and the journals come to this meeting, right, the journals realize that they need to start to get involved, because publication is the currency of the scientists doing the data generation. And in Fort Lauderdale, these people agree that, well, we still like the Bermuda Principle, we still like rapid pre-publication data release for these big data sets, but only if they're intended to be community resources or a community resource project. So big data sets created for the sake of producing a data set that will be useful by the community. Not scientist X who's doing you know, cancer genome screening, you know, for pancreatic cancer in certain population, right? That's hypothesis-driven research supposed to lead to a particular outcome. He's not generating this data solely to cre create a map of you know, pancreas cancer. So we're not going to require that kind of scientist to release his data before he publishes. Then he can wait for the normal data release requirement, which, which is still to release his data on publication. He's still making a share of data but not that fast. Okay, after this we start to get a number of other complaints. So, you know, the data generating scientists, they're basically genomicists and they're as much computer scientists and mathematicians as, as biologists, so they, you know, haven't really focused on the human aspect of what they're doing. But after the Genome Project is done and science becomes more and more sophisticated, um, and the data that we're to collect becomes much more textured in that we are no longer just collecting the raw sequence data. We need to attach to it phenotypic data, meaning data about who it came from, right? Racial, ethnic profile, age, gender, uh, various things like that. Disease state, right? We're, we're collecting, we, we want to learn something about diabetes, so we want to know people have diabetes, what type of diabetes, onset of what age, do they smoke, drink, um, you know, uh, have other disease indicators, right? This is all becoming fairly private information, information that starts to look like more like a medical health record than a piece 
data. And so in the databases that uh, have started to crop up for this new expanded type of data, um, dbGaP is, is the, uh, the database that's been used primarily for uh, what's called um, GWAS study, genome-wide association study. They, it has places to put non-genetic data um, like this clinical data, and we worry about protecting the human subjects. And so the new data policies, um, in addition to protecting the publication rights of the scientists, are also starting to protect the human subjects, and there are agreements associated with them. You can't reverse engineer the data. You can use it only for research purposes. So for example, there's a lot of concern in the U.S. about insurance companies using this data. Um, that's not allowed. Uh, there has to be some committee review of the research purposes, and it has to be destroyed, and a variety of other protections that go along with the use of this data. Okay. So there's a third generation of these policies begin around 2006, when we start to create a number of large-scale government-fronted GWAS projects. <coughs> Excuse me. And these start to implement what I call timing restrictions. And the restrictions that I've written about um, at length, and other I won't, I won't uh, bore you with all of that. There are two approaches that have been taken, though. One is called the embargo. Under the embargo approach, the data is released rapidly, just like it is under Bermuda. However, if you want to download the data from one of these databases, like dbGaP, you have to agree that you will not publish on the data for some embargo period. And that's usually 6 to 12 months. So you, as a data user scientist, you can look at dbGaP, you can look at it now, we don't have internet access. But if you did, you were right now and download a big data set from dbGaP. Say it's on, you know, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, uh, you know, genomes of uh, you know, male population in Chicago. You could download that. But it might have an annotation. The annotation might be embargo. Publication is embargoed for nine months. And that would mean you can use it, you can analyze it, but you can't make a presentation at a conference, uh, a poster, an abstract or submit a paper um, during that nine-month period. Now, how enforceable are those restrictions? Uh, yeah, as a lawyer, I tell you, it's a little unclear, and, uh, you know, <laughs> some of us that are interested in studying how successful these have actually been, and I can, just from some preliminary work, tell you not everybody uh, complies, and, and not everybody outside of sort of the U.S. and Europe even read English well enough to understand, right? So, I mean, a lot of these downloads are coming from China and other countries where, um, you know, the enforceability of these restrictions is probably uh, non-existent. So, the embargo approach, we, we keep the data out there quickly, we have the strong uh, encumbrances on patents um, but there is still relatively weak protection for the or the, the, the scientist publisher. The other the second approach is different, right? The second is what I call the retention approach. There are a number of private groups who, who have modeled themselves on the public genome project. Um, they've taken private funding, generally from the pharmaceutical industry, and funded large-scale genomic research. The first was the SNP consortium, um, which Worked toward the later half of the genome project. I, I was the legal advisor to the SNP consortium, so uh, knew them very well. And, and those same people have moved on uh, to do other consortia that are similar. And they allow the researchers that they fund to hold the data back for a private period. Again, six months to a year, roughly. But then they release it with no restrictions. Right? So during that six to 12 months, the researchers can write their papers, do their further analyses, get their head start, and then once the data is released, it's released, and you don't have to worry about enforcing these embargoes um, in places where you couldn't enforce them anyway. So it's a different approach. And patents are addressed through a more complex mechanism, um, but again, none of these none of these discoveries will be patented. 
And again, it's a different approach, but not one that the government has followed in its policy. Uh, it's a little bit afraid of the Bayh-Dole Act and limiting people's ability to pass. Okay, so that's, that's the uh, sort of a lead up to where we are today. Um, and I would have said more in maybe my presentation shorter, uh, had some very interesting developments not happened this summer. So this, this started in February of this year, where OSTC is our Office of Science and Technology Policy. It is within, this is an office within the White House, right? This is an executive branch office. Um, John Holdren uh, used to be the head. He's very well known in science policy. And he issued a memorandum in February all about increasing access to results of federally funded scientific research. This had two prompts. One was publication, and one was data. On the publication front, and we're not talking about open access publication, um, but we could, and I've written, I've written a lot about open access publication. Um, as many of you may know, the NIH has a policy that papers, uh, publications that are <coughs> derived from US government funded, or from NIH funded research, must be put onto a publicly accessible website, PubMed Center, within one year after their initial publication. So even if it's published in an Elsevier journal, within one year, it must go into PubMed Central open access for free. And Elsevier and you know, Taylor and all of the big publishers have had to agree to this um, because NIH funds so much research. Well, in February, uh, the government extended that from NIH to all of the other Agencies. Remember, the other left half of the pie chart, uh, the Department of Defense research doesn't get published really, so <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, all the other stuff that gets published, though, energy and you know, forestry, those uh, NASA, those sorts of papers will have to go into another public data. So that's on the publication side. Data, it was less clear what was meant in the whole memo. So in May. President Obama issued an executive order. It's actually a presidential executive order, which is rare. I mean, if you're not from the U.S., you don't appreciate that we don't get these that often. Um, George Bush issued the one for prohibiting research on human embryonic stem cells, right? That's, you know, but, but, it's, but, they're, but they're rare in the area of science policy. In fact, this is probably the most recent one that after this well, Obama reversed the stem cell one and then uh, issued this one. So it's every few it's not common. Um, the Office of Management and Budget on the same day issued policy uh, clarifying the executive order, and then NIH is um, developing a data catalog. So let me just talk about these very briefly. So the May 9th Open Data Policy Executive Order says that all government data, all government data, meaning data generated by the government, and data that is funded by the federal government must be made publicly accessible in a modifiable, searchable format, right? And what does this mean? I mean there's a, the OMB memo is fairly detailed, and you can find this all on the web. Um, and I'm happy to send people, I actually have copies of all this stuff here, but I, I can send you links if you're curious has to be fully discoverable and searchable, right? This is, this is the point that we absolutely want people to be able to create a Google of science, right? And Google is actually very interested in doing this, um, in allowing search of scientific data. Um, and each of these terms is defined in the OMB, uh, in what public accessible, blah, blah, blah. Um, so there is, there is a fair amount of detail, and this all has to be done relatively soon, right? So by November 1st of this year, every federal agency with a budget of more than $100 million, which is all the ones that we saw on the chart, um, must submit a plan to the OMB uh, showing how they're going to do this, right? And we're all very curious to see what these plans are, and some will be late and complete, and you know, the government and their half on furlough, not to be funded by Congress, but eventually this will this will happen. And um, you know, 
if it will show um, what, what exactly is happening here. And, and there are exceptions, right? There are built-in exceptions to protect uh, patient privacy, for example. Um, technologies of uh, defense, you know, uh, import, right? having national defense, homeland security, you know, these things, these things uh, will not be subject to this requirement. I enlarged on the biomedical front, on sort of the clean energy front. Um, you know, most, most things with the government fund, data will be made publicly accepted. And so the next big question about what it means to be publicly accessible is, you know, how, how can this be done effectively so that it can be searched? Right, so even today, if the government imposed this rule and said every lab is going to get data publicly accessible, that means that, you know, on Scientist X's website, his university web page, he might have a link to a bunch of Excel spreadsheets that have a bunch of data in them, right? And then Scientist Y might have a link to some other his department, you know, his lab web page, and it's some PDF files that, you know, show a scan of some you know, very disparate and, and not easily uh, consumable and digestible uh, matters. So NIH um, has taken the step of authorizing the creation of an NIH-wide data catalog. So NIH in the U.S. funds all of our biomedical research that's not in the private sector. It has 20 different institutes cancer, heart liver, blood, aging, you know, pediatric. Every one of those separate institutes right now operate semi-autonomously. They have different requirements. We have a National Library of Medicine, which runs PubMed Central. And, and if you've ever used PubMed Central, it's pretty good, right? I mean, it took them five years to get it up and running um, and mandatory, but it, now that it's there, it's good. You can search for any, you know, any subject, whether it's funded by National Cancer Institute, National Heart Rate or Blood Institute, you know, mental health, no matter which one, it doesn't matter. As a user, it's invisible to you. You just search on PubMed Central and you can find articles. And the idea is PubMed Central for data. Um, have one central repository where data is organized some way and how this is going to happen is, you know, it's, it's a huge multi-year project. I was just at a workshop last week at NIH talking about this data catalog and nobody really knows how, how to make it work, but everybody agrees that this would be a really good idea and it's essential if this data is going to be useful uh, for it to be <coughs> curated in some way and not just left to <coughs> every investigator in every university to put up the data in some way that he, you know, whatever is the most convenient thing, or probably whatever is the most convenient thing for his graduate student that he assigns this task to, as we all know, you know, that, that's how it's going to happen. Um, so there has to be a standardized NIH format, right? There will be a format. If this is genomic data, this is easy, right? It's been a format for the last for 15 or so years. Um, but if it's different, if it's, you know, behavioral data, uh, you know, data about, you know, the behavior of, of ants in, you know, a certain environment. There's no format for that yet, um, but there has to be something. There have to be meta tags and structures into which such data can be put, and they're thinking that there would be thousands of different possible fields, and somebody has to think about those and be able to add new fields. And so there's a significant data management curation task, which again will happen most likely at our National Library of Medicine, Part of NIH, but it's just a multi-million dollar, multi-year project. Um, but it's just starting, and uh, we think it will, will be good and a useful thing, and hopefully will be emulated by others. Um, the Wellcome Trust and, and the UK have the PubMed Center, uh, like PubMed Center, we hope that something similar happens on the data side, um, and the you know, PubMed Central is open to anybody. You don't have to be an NIH-funded researcher to deposit an article in PubMed Central. So 
again, theoretically, when this data catalog exists, perhaps you won't need to be a U.S. Uh, you know, government-funded researcher to deposit data in the NIH data catalog. It, it, you know, again, I would think, and having been part of the discussion, I, I, I think it's likely that the organizers uh, would welcome data from all sorts. Just once the thing is up and running, um, there was a lot of capacity, obviously, and uh, the idea is to create a public resource that's as valuable as possible. Um, linking to journal articles, of course, then is, is the next big step. And the publisher of Nature Genetics, uh, who attended this workshop, you know, said very clearly their uh, journal goal is to have every table in every article in their journal have hyperlink at the bottom so that you, know, you look at the table and say, that's an interesting graph. You know, what data is behind it? Just click on a link in the electronic version of the article and go to the primary data set and have some easy buttons to push to ingest it into your own program uh, in some way and rerun the data or combine it with something else. So um, anyway, that's the dream for the future. It's uh, not quite here yet, but you know, we're, uh, we're making a start. Hey, that's